All right. Let's pray. Father, Father of mercies, we thank you, Father, for this time that we have together. We pray, Father, you will bless our time. We pray, Father, that you will give us courage as we do evangelistic work. Pray, Father, you will be with all of these young people. Give them strength, Father. And, Father, bless them as they are growing up in in Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, so I am a little loud. Can you guys, is that loud? Okay. Um, Turn it down a little bit for me. I'm, I'm, I'm echoing so bad up here. All right, I think that's better. Uh, My name is DeAndre Hensley. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I am the minister for the, hey, I am the minister for the Fairfax Church of Christ in Winchester, just about 30 minutes away. And uh, I've been there now for five and a half years. And it's been the worst time of my life. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I've enjoyed it. Uh, It's uh, it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, but I have enjoyed it, ultimately. Um, I, I did not grow up believing in God. I wasn't sure there was a God. I wasn't really concerned about it, quite frankly. I wouldn't call myself an atheist. I wasn't really even an agnostic. I was just uh, unconcerned. I didn't care. And uh, that didn't really matter. I had some issues with Christianity. I didn't much care for Christian people. I thought Christian people were quite strange and awkward. And I thought you guys had some real weird beliefs. In fact, when I was in the sixth grade, my teacher told me that Christians were all cannibals, and I believed her. And uh, so, a lot of strange things that I grew up believing about Jesus and about Christian people. Uh, I was not the, making the best of decisions when I was younger. I grew up in a good home, but I didn't much care for that. And so, I decided to go my own way, and I did that for a while until... Uh, I kind of got into some trouble, and I thought to myself, well, I need to fix myself. I need to do something about this. I had two groups of friends. I had my friends who got me in trouble, and then I had two friends that uh, were Christian people. They were members of the Dahlia Street Church of Christ, where I was baptized later. And uh, they invited me to church for about two years. They texted me about every Sunday morning. I would get a text message from them. Uh, with an invitation to go to church. Usually I was uh, not waking up until after uh, church was over, but they did, they did not stop. They persisted. So for two years that went on, and finally, after I got in some trouble, I decided to go. So I went, and I went for about a month, and I didn't much like it because uh, the, preacher, the preacher who was there was very uh, convicting, he was very convicting with the things that he taught. Uh, he had a very good voice, and he was very good at, at teaching scripture. He was very, you know, he was just very thoughtful. And I didn't much like that. I said, I don't, I don't think this is for me. So I left, and then about eight months later, or six months later, I came back because I got in more trouble. And I said, that's enough. Enough of that. I'm done with this. So I went to church not really knowing if I believed in God. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about Jesus, and I didn't much care for Christian people, but I figured I need to try something different, so I did. And uh, it took me about eight months, but eventually I was baptized. It took me a while. Now, I tell you that story because I, the whole reason I went to church was not because of God, Jesus, the Bible, but because of how nice the people were to me. That was it. It was just the, the way the people treated me. They were kind to me. When I walked through the doors, they didn't treat me like a stranger. I didn't come dressed like everybody else. I didn't wear a suit. Uh, I came uh, very sloppy, I would say, probably rolling out of bed, basically, because I wasn't used to waking up so, so early. And, uh, but I went, and the people never pointed that out. They never discouraged me. They never disrespected me. They always made me feel welcome and appreciated, but they always challenged me as well. And they always questioned me on my decisions and the things that I was going to do. Like I said, I share all that because I just want you to uh, understand kind of what we're getting into. We're going to talk about what's called the heart of evangelism, and we'll come back to that story I just shared with you in just a second. But uh, let me ask you guys this question. When you, th- when you think of evangelism, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Just say it. As long as it's not bad, say it. 
Say again. Spreading God's word. Spreading God's word. Okay. What else? Teaching. Okay. What else? Uh, will you become a Christian, please? Is that what you said? Okay. All right. Will you become a Christian, please? What else? Okay, someone's trying to bring somebody to the Christian faith. Say again. Delivering. Yeah, I like that, delivering. It's a good word. Missions, okay. So going far away and teaching. Okay. So you got, there's really three evangelistic areas. You have missions. You have uh, personal evangelism. And then you have what I would call cold call evangelism, which is like door knocking. Did, 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 did door knocking ever come to your mind when I said that, something like that? Kind of cold call where you just talk to people. You don't really know the person, but you just talk to them and you uh, try to say something to them. Now, all three of those, I would say, are things that we should all participate in. Uh, you shouldn't say that we shouldn't do one or not do the other. All of those are necessary. Uh, cold call is definitely necessary because um, there are some people that you're just never going to meet, uh, people that, you know, they don't leave the house. Uh, my mom, for example, she's uh, very sick. She doesn't get out a whole lot. Uh, she's uh, uh, a shut-in, technically. She's kind of bedridden. And so you would never meet my mom out anywhere. You're just never going to. So certain people, you may have to do certain things like that. In general, though, most of the time evangelism is just done on a personal level. And then you have that missions level that you can do as well. And that's fine. Uh, we, like I said, we have to do all three of those. We shouldn't do one to the neglect of the other, uh, most definitely. So uh, let me give you just a couple of facts about evangelism. The word evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion. And that word translates in your New Testament as the word gospel. So every time you see the word gospel in the New Testament, that is the Greek word euangelion. Uh, it's also, well, you'll find it in some other areas, but let me not belabor that. Um, evangelism really happens when you mention the name of Jesus. Now, everybody, turn in your Bibles for a second. Go to Romans 1.16. Go to Romans 1.16. In fact, are they going to put it up here? Okay, it'll be up here as well. Romans 1.16, the Apostle Paul writes, if you're not there, you can just look on the screen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of who? Say it louder. Christ. Okay, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That word gospel really isn't, in its time, it wasn't really a religious word. It was a very normal word, in fact, during their time. And the idea behind gospel is just somebody who brings good news. So when you're preaching the gospel to a person, what you're doing is you're bringing them what? Yeah, good news. You're not bringing them bad news. You're bringing them good news, ultimately. And, you, of course, you want to make sure that you make that very clear to them. Um, I, I heard one man say that uh, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's all it is. We're all just beggars, and we're trying to help other beggars find some food. That's all we're trying to do. So it's not that we're better than anyone when we evangelize. It's not that we're special or anything. The difference is that we're just trying to uh, help somebody else who is in need find some bread for themselves in the same way that you and I have found some bread for ourselves. And that's also important for us to uh, always keep in mind. Now let me do a little exercise with all of you. Um, if you had five minutes, based on what I told you about myself, if you had five minutes with me to tell me something about the gospel what would you do? Go ahead. Give me a scenario. Nobody? You got something? Okay. Let me say it again. Oh, well, go ahead. When, when I wasn't a Christian, based on what I told you.
Okay? So you'd start with here, believe, uh, confess, repent, and be baptized. You would do that? Okay. Now, now let, me, let me give you a little bit more. Well, go ahead. Okay, yeah, give me an invitation. Okay, I like that. Okay, good. All right. Now, I would have responded with, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, so where would you go after that? Okay, I like that. What do you know? And I would say, I would probably try to be nice. I wouldn't say, well, I think Christian people are, are strange, right? I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I would say something like, uh, I don't really know anything about the Bible, um, and I don't really uh, know much about uh, religion. That's what I would have called it. I don't know much about religion. So would have gone that route. Okay, so take me further. Now that we kind of have a direction, take me further. The basic. Okay, what would be the basics? Okay. Now, I wouldn't call that basics, but that's what you said was really good. That's good. I like that. What else? So he's gotten me now. He's taken me to, to the Bible. He's taken me to God here for a second. Um, he's taken me to Christ now. So where do we go from there? Okay, here, let, let me, let me kind of help you guys out a little bit. So, I'm making bad decisions, right? I told you all this information about me. Just assume that we've had this conversation. I've told you all of this information about me. I'm making bad decisions. Go. What are you going to tell me? Okay, I got two. You first. Okay, so now, so I'm going to turn around and shut the door behind me. So we're done now, okay? So what else we got? Go ahead. Ah, okay, I like that. Only way to help, with, help me with my what? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're on the right, you're, you're very much on the right track with that. When I, when I first stood up here, I told you something about myself, right? Okay. Did that get your attention at all? Did that help you kind of get your attention? If I had just gone straight in and just started quoting various scriptures and things like that and kind of gave you maybe a, a wooden uh, kind of rigid understanding of what we're talking about, would that have gotten your attention as much? Maybe not. So, so what did I do? Okay. Okay, so I, I said something new. Did, did I say something personal? Okay. Do you think people appreciate when you're personal? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I'll give you an example. My mom has had breast cancer three times. Do you think that when somebody is going through breast cancer that she can help them, somebody else? You think she can encourage them a little bit? Because my mom, she went through it three times. She went through three rounds of chemo. She had so much chemo pumped into her body um, that she now, she, the effect, she hadn't had cancer in 15 years and the effects still haven't left her. She's still sick. Um, and I'm not going to explain what all that is, but the, she, she took a lot of burden upon her just so she could live. Um, so now she's a shut-in. Think about that. Uh, so do, do you think that she can, you know, when somebody's going through that, somebody's going through something tough, if you kind of meet them where they are, does that make it easier for you to talk to them? Okay. 
what, what I'm trying to get at here is it's, it's good to build a connection with somebody. It's good to build a connection with somebody. If you can build a connection with somebody, you can talk to them about things, right? He, he, for example, uh, he said, you're going to hell, right? Okay. He doesn't know me like that. So I don't appreciate him saying that. But if somebody said that to me today, based on something that I did, I would say, man, you're right, i got to turn around. You see the difference between those two things? Somebody came up to me to rebuke me, a brother in Christ, says, brother, you are making poor decisions. But if he never met me like that, he, he doesn't know me that well, guess what? I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to hear it from him. Go ahead. Okay, there you go. You don't start with accusations. Very good, very good. Very good. There, are, there are a few people I've dealt with that kind of like the drill sergeant approach, but those are kind of rare. Those are kind of rare. I've met a few people who are like that, but those are kind of rare. What I was trying to get at here mainly was, would you mention Jesus? Would Jesus come up in the conversation? Um, if you think about it, Jesus is really, you think about the message of the gospel, okay? The heart of evangelism is, is, is Jesus. The message of the gospel is not just a message, it is a person, right? So when we're telling somebody about something, we're not just giving them a message, we're telling them about a what? A person, right? Okay? So, like, one of the things that I often find with people is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest walls people put up is they say, well, what about all this, the issues and the suffering that I've gone through, right? I've gone through all these things in my life. I've experienced them. When I was uh, 12, uh, my brother died, and that was my best friend. And when he died, it just devastated me, absolutely devastated me. It just destroyed our family. Well, it didn't destroy our family, but it really just brought us down, took us down, and uh, made everything horrible for us. Well, one thing I never really could get over was I thought, well, why does my brother have to die? How come I had to lose my brother? Why has he got to be the one? Um, why, it, almost like I'm feeling as though God is picking on me. Why, why do you have to bother me? If there is a God, why are you picking on me? But then it had never dawned on, on me until I became a Christian that God knows exactly how I feel. Exactly. So God gave his only son, right? So did God suffer a loss? Now someone's going to say something like, well, Jesus, he came back three days later. Well, if you're a Christian, then you believe that all people who have died will one day be risen again. So all the people that we have lost in our life, they will live again. That's what the scriptures teach, right? So that doesn't minimize it. He had to watch his son suffer, right? And I'm a, I'm a dad. I have a two-year-old. So if I had to watch my son suffer for a second, that's a second too long. That's a second too long. I don't want to watch him suffer at all. He had to watch his son suffer in one of the worst ways for hours. He had to watch him be beaten. He had to watch him be mocked. He had to watch him be nailed to a cross. He had to watch him have a crown of thorns placed upon his head. How uncomfortable that would have been and horrible that would have been. He had to watch him cry out in agony. He had to hear his son say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he had to let his son go for three days. So all of a sudden, it starts to dawn on me. God knows exactly how I feel. He has felt the pain of loss. On top of that, Jesus has, pelt, has excuse me, felt the pain of suffering, hasn't he? So I've suffered in my life. Everybody goes through some suffering. Would you guys agree? No, no, nobody lives in this world without some suffering. Yes. Uh, it says that he was in Hades. So the que so now you're asking a, a hard question. The question you're asking is a little bit harder to, harder to get than, but he went to Hades, and I guess it depends on how you understand Hades, whether Hades is... Uh, that hold, in fact, I know he went to that holding place, which is Hades, but he wasn't in heaven with God. I guess, is, is that what you mean? Okay. Well, hold on a sec. Go ahead. Uh, being where? I don't think I understand what you mean by that, but go ahead. 
Uh, no, Hades was described as the place of the dead. Um, later in Revelation chapter 19, you'll see that Hades and death are thrown into the lake of fire. Hades is a, a place. Um, essentially, it's the grave. I, I'm sorry, I did not mean to open up that because that was not at all where I intended to go. But now I've left y'all with a question, didn't I? Did I leave you guys with a question? Somebody's going to have to answer this question. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's called Hades. Hades is the holding place. See, see, now what I'm doing is a. Oh, this was. I should not have brought that up. Go ahead. It, all right, how about this? Everybody go home and ask your preacher. Put them on the spot, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> I, did, I didn't mean to open up that. I'll make sure in the next lesson not to do that because that's totally not what I was trying to get at. But the point is, God has felt the pain of suffering. The Son of God has felt the pain of suffering. And when I know that Jesus has suffered alongside me, that makes Jesus that much more appealing. He's not as, it's not as though God is in heaven away from our suffering, watching down on us and, and looking at us with, with no kind of uh, pity for us or, or no grace for us. It's not in that sense. It's the, the idea that Jesus really came. He really lived. He really suffered with you and I. He really was hungry. He really was thirsty. He really was sleepless. He suffered with anxiety and he was mocked and beaten. You guys ever been bullied? You ever dealt with a bully or something like that? He dealt with a ton of them. So he was hated by people. All the things that we have gone through in this life, I guess you could say, uh, he has to some extent experienced it. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get you guys off track there. So, uh, Let me give you one encouragement here. Evangelism is, can be fearful, can it be? It can be scary to tell someone about Jesus, right? But let me ask you this. Is it okay to be afraid? Is it okay to be afraid, y'all? What do you guys think on this side? Is it okay to be afraid? Yeah, fear, fear is okay. The question about fear is, are we going to let fear stop us? When fear stops us from doing things we should do, fear is bad. Sometimes fear is good. Um, I don't jump out of airplanes. I'm afraid of that. Uh, I, have a, I have a fear, and I think people who jump out of airplanes are crazy. <laughs> I think that's crazy. <laughs> I don't know why anyone would do that. Uh, but my fear stops me from doing things like that. Um, I try my best not to let my fear stop me from telling people about Jesus. I try. Sometimes my fear overcomes me, if I'm honest. Even as a preacher, my fear still overcomes me from time to time. So let me show you one last verse. I got way off track here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and I think it's going to be up here on the screen in just a second as well. And this will be our last verse before I let you guys go. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, please. Paul writes, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Was the Apostle Paul afraid? What do you guys think? It's okay to be afraid, isn't it? The question is, do we let our fear stop us? So. All right. Very good. Let's close out with a quick prayer. Father of mercies, as we come to understand you each and every day, we look to you, Father, for our food. We look to you, Father, for our, our rains from heaven. And Father, we thank you for all that you give us. And Father, we are such an ungrateful people, but we're so grateful for Jesus that not only, Father, does he provide for us the forgiveness of sins, but reminds us, Father, that he, has, that he and you have both suffered with us. Father, we thank you for that, and may we Treasure those things within our heart, Father, as we go through hard times in this life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.